in every marriage, there will be conflicts and there will be disputes. We could operate on an insult to insult mode. You insult me, I will insult you back. Insult for insult. Now, the scriptures say you can do that. Or you can go higher up and you say, no, I'm not going to trade insult for insult, but blessing for insult. Amen. I can move in that mode. And then it says in verse 10, can we read verse 10 and 11 together starting now? For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. That means we must learn to handle conflicts well. Now, all marital conflicts and all relational conflicts, for that matter, can fall into two types. Those that can be solved, we have talked about this last week, the solvable problems, and those that cannot be solved. That means they are perpetual. They will forever be a part of our lives. Now, for example, you want to be more involved in ministry, in church, but your wife doesn't. Or you want to have children, but your husband doesn't. You are a homebody who likes a quiet weekend, just you and your book, but your wife loves noisy weekends where all the siblings and relatives can come together for fellowship. You feel that your husband is flirtatious, that he stares at women in parties, but he feels that you are overly sensitive, you are needy, you are clingy, and you're possessive. <laughs> Couples have perpetual problems when they're arguing over the same issue again and again, year after year after year after year. Now, remember what I told you last week. We don't have to solve all our perpetual problems for our marriage to thrive. You don't have to solve all your major marital relational issues in order for you to have a happy marriage. But when a perpetual problem becomes serious, all right, when it becomes what? Serious. That means we are feeling rejected by our partner. We are condemning each other. We are becoming contemptuous. And the moment we argue, we discuss, we start condemning. Or we are unwilling to compromise. Or we are disengaging ourselves emotionally. There is now a distance in your heart toward each other. Then we can't love it off anymore. We can't ignore it any longer. This problem is critical to the happiness of your relationship and to the survival of your marriage. We have what is called a grid lock. A grid lock, right? That means you, we are stuck. A grid lock means that you are stuck and you are caught in a frustrating uh, situation when you cannot move forward or backward. There is no progress that can be made. So what is a grid lock again? All right, when we are stuck in a frustrating situation where no progress can be made. And the way to cope with an unsolvable problem is to move the grid lock to dialogue. Now listen to what Sanja said, moving from grid lock to dialogue. Yep. All right, everybody say this together, say grid lock to lo dialogue. Grid lock to dialogue. Five times louder, from grid lock to dialogue. From grid lock to dialogue. We must learn, church, we must learn to talk about the problem without hurting each other. No criticizing, no condemning, no screaming and yelling at each other. To deal with a perpetual insolvable problem, we first have to understand its cause. You know, the issue can range from serious to ridiculous. Serious like having a baby, a child or not, relocating to another city, quitting a job you know, to be a housewife, or to something so ridiculous that you guys cannot agree on how the socks are to be folded. All right, but whatever the issue is, behind every perpetual unsolvable problem, there's always a cause. And the cause always, always stems from a dream that is unaddressed or not respected. I want to say that again. And the cause always stems from a dream that's unaddressed or not respected. Often, our deepest dreams are rooted in childhood or youth. These are the times and the years when our fundamental values are formed and shaped. 
So when we are married, we long to recreate some of these warmest and fondest memories of the life that we dreamed of. Proverbs 15 verse 4, the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Don't rubbish it. Good friends, don't rubbish. Don't rebut it. Instead, we must encourage our husband and wife to explore the dream further. So if you want to encourage our partner to talk openly and to talk honestly, please, don't do this. Don't do this. Dear, I've always dreamed of climbing Mount Everest. What? <laughs> climbing Mount Everest? Come on, come on, come on, son. We can't possibly afford this right now. And look, it's ridiculous. Mount, Bukit Tima maybe, Mount Everest. <laughs> There's nothing more stressful than climbing a mountain. You know, just by standing on a table, I got vertigo already. Then forget it. I mean, if, if you start talking like this, what will your wife say? Forget it. So what happens? The dream gets buried deeper. And unhappiness increases. Now instead, do this. Dear, I've always dreamed of climbing Mount Everest. Mount Everest? But why do you think you want to climb Mount Everest? What would climbing Mount Everest do for you? I feel like I want to challenge myself. You know that when I was younger, you know, I was always weak physically. And mom and dad is always so protective, you know, telling me I cannot do this, I can't do that. Be careful, be careful, be careful. So to me, if I can climb a mountain, especially Mount Everest, right, standing at the top of the world, I would just, you know, feel so liberated, you know, it's such a sense of accomplishment. Mount Everest. Okay, let's, let's keep this conversation going, okay? Mount Everest. Bukit uh, Timah? All right, you see, now. Mount Everest. Mount Everest. We don't have to share each other's dream. <laughs> you know, in fact, if she's going to climb Mount Everest, I'm not going to climb with her. Now, listen. <laughs> we don't have to, we don't have to sh agree to the dream or feel like to accept the dream means I got to participate in it. But we must show respect. We must show consideration. So three levels of honouring our partner's dream. I'm teaching you how to do it right now, okay? Three levels. Number one, be understanding and be interested to learn more about the dream. Now, remember what the Bible says in Proverbs 24 and verse 3. Through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it is established. Wow, beautiful verse. Everybody say this out loud together with me. Let's all read this together starting now. Through wisdom, a house is built. By understanding, it is established. So, understanding establishes your marriage, your family, your house. By showing understanding, even if we don't share the dream, be a friend. That's why I'm we are telling, trying to tell you to do. Just be a friend. When a friend tells you that, that he or she is doing something, it doesn't mean you've got to join them, right? But you show understanding. Be and do what the best friend would do. Listen and show interest. Philippians 2 verse 3, let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. All the more your husband or your wife. So be interested in the hopes, desires, wants, needs, aspirations of your husband, your wife. Now that's level number one. Level number two, you offer financial support for the dream. If you want to take this a little bit more, you offer financial support. So even if I'm not going to join Sun to climb Mount Everest or any mountain, I can show my support by buying her the equipment she wants. I can show support by chipping in, you're right, uh, to, to get her the necessary training for the mountain climbing. So you can show financial support. Now, level number three, be a part of the dream. Now, this is the ultimate. You can go all the way. This will really enrich your marriage. <laughs> right? That means, you know, son, I'm going to join you. Okay, we climb together. <laughs> but even if you're not willing to be a part 
of the dream, simply by honouring, by respecting it, will break the gridlock. It will break, the, it will take the sting out of the gridlock or out of the perpetual unsolvable problem. Now, if we follow these three simple steps, be a dream detective, number one. Step number two, communicate clearly, honestly, your thoughts, your feelings. Number three, end the gridlock. How? By respecting the non-negotiable core values and then work out a compromise with those areas you are flexible about. We are able to move beyond the gridlock of the perpetual problems that we have and we can save our marriage and keep it happy. And I just want to say that, you know, it might take a while for us to bring back that happy feelings, you know, because sometimes great luck can really be very, very hurtful. You know, and we say things that we don't really mean, but to the other party, you know, it's just unforgettable, all right? You just really cut them into pieces. <laughs> and let me tell you, even us practicing, you know, just what we're going to say, and, oh, it's very stressful. <laughs> Nobody likes fighting. But I just want to say that, you know, we must have faith and patience and commitment to the whole process. Eventually, you must trust God that we can come to a place that we're able to talk to each other in a good-natured way and hopefully with some humour over it, you know, and that you can still have a very happy marriage. Now, as we come to the end of our Relationship Builder series, how many of you enjoyed this series so far, right? Yeah. If we, if, now, listen, I'm coming to the end now. If we still find ourselves asking the question, is there all there is to our marriage? Is there all there is to our marriage? We've been married now for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. For, is there all there is to marriage? Then, what is really missing is a deeper sense of shared meaning. And this is what we want to end with. Shared meaning. Everybody say shared meaning. Shared meaning. Now, marriage is more than two individuals each having their own careers, raising up kids, splitting houseworks or uh, money to save, and having sex every once in a while. You know, marriage is more than just two roommates who happen to live under the same roof and hopefully in the same room and every once in a while make love. Friends, listen, marriage is more than that. In marriage, two soulmates become one. You know, and the best thing we can do is to create an inner life together. I want to say that. You know, in marriage, is two soulmates become one. And the best thing we can do for each other is to create an inner life together. So, Sun and I, we are two separate individuals. All right? Two different ministry philosophies. Now, we have, I have my own inner life. She has her own spiritual life. But in our marriage, we must seek to create an inner life that both of us, we share, because the two has become one. Now, this is biblical. When God created Adam and Eve, He created them to meet each other's needs, right? We know that. But in their mutual interdependence, well, they have a common purpose. Now, you look in the Bible right now, Genesis 1 and verse 27. So God created man in His own image. In the image, God, in the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. So God honoured their individualities. They are distinctive. Male and female, He created them. Adam will forever be Adam. Eve will forever be Eve. They will have their own roles. They will have their own responsibilities, their own goals, their own values, their own vision, their own dreams. But then, look at the next verse. God bless them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. So in their existence as a married couple, there was shared meaning and purpose. Individuals, but they have a common spirit life, inner life, purpose. And creating a shared meaning doesn't mean that you and you and your spouse must see eye to eye on everything. Now, son and I, we don't see eye to eye on many things. You may be surprised, but we don't. Amen. Uh-oh. <laughs> I mean, Instead, you know. there is a blending, all right? Blending. We must develop, develop a life together that can incorporate both our dreams. 
Therefore, a crucial goal for every marriage is to create an atmosphere that will encourage us to talk honestly. We talk about that a lot, about our convictions, our dreams, our values, our beliefs, and our goals. The more open and the more respectful we are with what is important to each other, the more there will be a blending of our sense of meaning. So City Harvest Church, let us create happy marriages in this lifetime where our convictions our values, our goals, our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations, our wants, our needs are known and celebrated. I love this. Remember, we used to have a tagline in City Harvest Church. We always say City Harvest Church is a place where dreams are fulfilled and success celebrated. And it must be the same for our marriage. Our marriage must be a place where dreams are honored, are respected, are achieved and our convictions, our values, our desires, they are celebrated. 